Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Stephen Holmes, who is the Eugene Meyer Professor of Law at NYU. His new book is Matador's Cape, America's Reckless Response to Terror. Stephen, welcome to Berkeley. It's nice to be here. Where were you born and raised? I was born in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh -huh. I lived there until I was about 12, I think, 13. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, my mom was a school teacher, and uh, my dad was a businessman, kind of disenchanted businessman, I guess. Uh, how did they shape my... You know, growing up in the Midwest, that's, in a way, uh, I lived in the Midwest um, uh, for the first, uh, through high school, through college, actually. And I think that was a, had a big impact on me. Uh, afterward, of course, I went to the East Coast, and I traveled a lot, lived in Europe. But living in middle America, I think, I don't know what it, it's kind of stability, and it may be a distance from turbulence. I'm not sure. But I think there, there's something that's profound in me that's still Midwestern. Were, were, was uh, political theory, issues of politics discussed around the day? Well, account? my grandmother was a union organizer, mm -hmm. and uh, she was a, she, she, her job was to organize women strikers for the International Lady Garment Workers Union. Mm -hmm. And she was a very active politician, was elected politician in St. Louis. So there was a political atmosphere and a kind of militant uh, uh, atmosphere in my family when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So that's probably part of my, part of my psychology, too. Mm -hmm. And where did you do your undergraduate work? And then I went to undergraduate uh, school at uh, a place called Denison University in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to Yale to do my PhD. And, and what was uh, the subject of your uh, dissertation? And, and what, what field did you choose once you were well, doing Well, so I have a checkered career mm -hmm. in the academy. And I st my PhD is in philosophy. And I got a philosophy PhD at Yale. And I wrote a dissertation uh, largely, which became my first book, on Benjamin Constant mm -hmm. and the origins, the, the origins of modern liberalism and the uh, 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 psychological and economic theories behind liberal political theory. Uh, and I did that at Yale. And my um, uh, first job turned out to be in a political science department, because out of Yale, I went to Harvard. And I was hired to teach political theory. And from there, I worked in political theory and teaching for 10 years or so. And finally, I moved to law school at the University of Chicago. And I've been teaching in a law school ever since. So, so what does it take to do political theory, political philosophy? I mean, what are the skills involved if students want to the do that? The skills. <clears throat> well, I've been thinking, you mentioned this uh, before. And I, th I think the advantage for a of, that a political theorist has for studying politics, there are a few things that are important. One is that when you study the history of political thought, you're studying political systems that have long disappeared, many political systems. You don't suffer from the kind of temporal par parochialism that most political scientists suffer from. We, we, political theorists don't think politics began in 1945. They're aware <laughs> of other enormous political important, you know, the Roman Empire, maybe mm -hmm. the most important political entity in human history. We, we're aware that it exists. So there's a breaking through of temporal parochialism. And that's very important because if you study today capitalism or uh, democracy, it seems like there's something natural about these systems. But anyone with a large historical perspective knows that there are tiny spots in human history. And they have, they're very improbable. And they, have a, they must have enormously complex uh, preconditions. So uh, they are very unlikely. So that's an, an interest and something obvious to political theorists that maybe political scientists who are more, to take the present state of the world for granted, wouldn't see. That's one thing. The second thing is, um, I think, the, uh, the fact that political theorists, classical political theorists, had a, uh, an understanding of human motivation, which is much more complex mm. than the one that's common today due to the hegemony or power of economic models that place rational, calculating self-interest at the heart of human motivation. And uh, political theorists from Aristotle through Tocqueville have a much more, mm -hmm. much more subtle, much more complicated understanding, including an awareness of, uh, of passions. Uh, uh, they understand that human, the reason uh, e economic theory of motivation doesn't work, for, this is just a summary of the, my summary of what classical political theorists would say, is that human beings often desire and don't desire the same thing at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
uh, they often have contradictory beliefs. And their beliefs shape their desires, and their desires shape their beliefs. So that, so that if you think that way, the very concept of maximizing your preferences does, makes little sense. So I'd say the, 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 the theory of human nature in political, that political theorists mm. are accustomed to reading about, to taking for granted, is much more adequate to political reality than is the, the prevailing model that comes from economics. And, and how uh, teaching in a law school, how has that uh, helped inform your work as a political theorist uh, or vice versa? Okay, so law, what is law? And uh, there are a lot of ways to talk about it. It's a buckle between wealth and power, that's one way. I think one simple, a reductionist approach, but it's not unimportant, not uninteresting, is that law is a system for helping rich people keep their money. That is, <laughs> instead of thinking of uh, the center of law as a um, uh, human rights and the Bill of Rights and protection of freedom of speech and so forth, I think you have to look about at the relation between law and power. And it's strange, but in most discussions of law and the rule of law, uh, the most obvious fact about law, which is the prevalence of special interest legislation and special interest adjudication and special interest implementation of law, seems to disappear. So I think basically being in a law school has made me very aware of the role of asymmetries of power in society, the, mm. the domination of asymmetries of power in society over law. And uh, any theory of law or rule of law has to take that into account. And I think one of the great uh, lessons of st studying law from the inside is that this is very clear. It doesn't mean that the rule of law is unimportant or that it doesn't exist or you can't distinguish between rule by law, which is law as a stick with which the powerful beat the weak. That's an extreme version. I think there is such a thing as rule of law, but you have to understand what it is. So I, I guess being in a law school, the eye-opening nature of the experience is understanding or trying to understand something very difficult, which is the role of the relation between power and law. Just, just one example of this. Whose rights were protected first in Western history? The rights of orphans or the rights of big landowners? Well, you know the answer to this, and the answer suggests that you can't detach uh, law and justice from asymm asymmetries of power. So once you take that into account, it's kind of a legal realism, that's what I'm talking about here. Once you take it into account, it has a, actually a very profound impact on your understanding of ideas of justice and legality and due process. So as a theorist in a law school, what made you take up the, the challenge of uh, looking at uh, the reckless uh, U.S. response to 9-11? Well, the first uh, impulse came from the fact that I live in the West Village and uh, my balcony has a, had a view on the World Trade Center and I received a call about well, a little before nine on September 11th, 2001 from a friend of my son who'd been living there over the summer and said, there's you know, something happened, look out the window. And I stood there and watched mm -hmm. the second plane come. And it, you, know, you get up in the morning and watch 3,000 people be murdered in front of you, you don't get over it very easily. It has, it's a very disturbing experience. And I think, and that was shared by many of my colleagues at NYU. So I think that the, the personal experience of that, uh, that event was, had a big impact on me. I felt addled, maybe I still am, by that uh, for months afterward. And then of course I observed uh, the response of the American government. So there was mainly the, the, the personal experience of seeing it and then watching our government, in my opinion, go off the rails in, this, in its response to the attack. Uh, uh, now, the legal aspects of this have been very important because there have been lawyers, many lawyers, hired gun lawyers, we call them, uh, who have been w abetting and, uh, and enabling uh, this reckless and irresponsible and unethical in many dimensions response to 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, you said yesterday in your lecture that when you look at this response, it, it's a mixture of helplessness mm. and... and uh, power, omnipotence. Omnipotence fantasies. Yeah, it's yeah kind omnipotence. Of omnipotence. Talk a little about that. And, and it, it's interesting because you've just told us that a, a political, what a political hmm. uh, theorist can bring to the table is kind of a, an understanding of human motivation. Of the human psychology. Well, I think it was one of the uh, extraordinary uh, things to look at is how the group in power, the, the Cheney-Rumsfeld group, in Washington had been gloating about their incredible monopoly on power in the world. 
uh, before 9-11, and they were fantasizing about a missile shield and how they would be able to act any way they wanted in the world and push anyone around, and they themselves would be invulnerable and untouchable and so forth. So 9-11 was a huge, besides being an enormous shock to everyone, it was a particular shock to people who were uh, wallowing in their sense of omnipotence. And uh, uh, you have to remember that in the days following the attack, at every morning briefing, they were being told by their briefers that they live in a city that, where, with their families where they could be, where the city itself could be incinerated in the middle of the night with no warning. And I think it was a very, and there was almost nothing they could do about it. In other words, what they saw in 9-11, it's important to understand what they saw. They saw the possibility of a follow-up nuclear sneak attack. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a, a, a fear abetted by the this public statements of bin Laden who said that America deserves its own Hiroshima. It was abetted by many rumors that have unverified of loose suitcase nukes that have been smuggled out of Russia and so forth. And they were being told that this was a serious danger. And I think under that pressure, under the pressure of a, of a fantasy of a nuclear attack, decapitation strike, destroying the American system of government practically, because destroying Washington, D.C., where the entire government is located, they panicked. They, they were rattled. They were seriously rattled. And all of the important and serious discussions about their hidden agendas and the vested interests of the petroleum industry and the arms business and, the, and the, uh, those interested in expanding executive power, all those things are true, but they, you need to add to them by, by seeing how, um, how rattled they were by this sudden revelation of their own total vulnerability and impotence, you know, as they saw it, to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. and, and this really led them to misperceive who the adversary uh, uh, was. And, and you're suggesting that the misperception came from paradigms, ways of thinking mm. that related to a different area, mm. because both Rumsfeld and Cheney, the most powerful figures in the administration, really were atavisms from the Cold War. Oh, yeah. I mean, so one theory is that the Cold War mentality, in, in the Cold War mindset, in the September 10th mindset of these guys who came from the Cold War, was that the only dangerous actors in the international system uh, were states. And uh, I think that did affect their shift. They, they, they didn't keep their eye on the ball. They, they were unable to concentrate on the non-state actors who attacked the United States and instead shifted attention to Iraq, a rogue state. So the mystery of the response to 9-11 is why did they do that? And one explanation could be that they still believed ardently that the only dangerous actor were states and a terrorist group couldn't do any harm if it were not supported by a state. But I think a psychologically more intriguing or more complete answer has to take account of the fact that the terrorists who attacked us are diffuse, Protean could mm -hmm. come from any place in the world. You, they live in, they're, they're, they're hidden in the suburbs of Hamburg and so forth. And uh, that is one of the things that makes them undeterrable, that our great power to concentrate military force in one place, in a single battlefield, on a single battlefront, is useless against a dispersed, worldwide dispersed enemy. So there was a fantasy, I think, some kind of magical thinking, which uh, made them believe that if that somehow uh, by uh, uh, attacking Iraq, which is, a, which is a target they could attack mm. with their means. And Rumsfeld said that, because he, 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 he liked Iraq as opposed to Afghanistan, because there were targets. There were yeah. targets. It's a place to attack. And, it, and there's a, I think they thought if they, in their minds, could graft Osama bin Laden onto Saddam Hussein, mm -hmm. then they could topple Saddam's statue and hang Saddam and then destroy Saddam's territorial base, they would somehow have a strong effect on Al-Qaeda, which is, makes no sense, has no mm -hmm. logical sense. But uh, I think there, there was somehow an element of, I call it battlefront nostalgia, looking f uh, to turn something impalpable into something palpable, which could be destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of the story. I mean, there are other things, such as under, in the Clinton administration, the Clinton National Security Team was had been talking for years uh, about al-Qaeda as the major threat to the United States. And during those years, people like Wolfowitz and Rumsfeld and so on were saying that's nonsense. Uh, 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 non-state actors are not important. Only rogue states are dangerous. So after we were attacked by a non-state actor, 
they were faced with a dilemma. Were they going to say Clinton was right and we were wrong? No, they weren't going to say that. So part of the impulse to go to Iraq was also to prove to themselves and to others that they had always been right. Mm -hmm. You, you uh, make uh, a point about the adversary, which we'll, we'll talk about the adversary and what was really going on in a moment, but you make the point that what they couldn't see was the, the adversary was a product of the wealth and prosperity that mm. we had created. Explain that, because it's truly an important point. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it, it's not that they were groomed by a rogue state, but rather they were just an unintended outcome of, of the, the world we had created. Yeah, you, you remember, it's really fascinating. So I think you start from the premise that no one in power wants to blame themselves, or, and no one who's been attacked wants to accept blame on uh, the, the part of the, the victim doesn't want to uh, admit any complicity uh, in it, his own vulnerability. But in fact, if you ask why non-state uh, terrorists have the capacity to harm us, to inflict grievous injury on us, you have to say that they use, they piggyback upon the instrumentalities that we have created. Uh, I don't think, you know, the main things are cheap airline tickets, the internet, ATM system, private banking, and of course, uh, very importantly, weapons, that, the fantasy, the weapons that we have invented can endanger us, petrodollars that we are pouring into unstable parts of the world. Um, these are, uh, in a way, the conditions of our life, uh, of our prosperity. It's impossible for us to declare war on cheap airline tickets. Nonetheless, that's the instrument that can be used to harm us. So I think there was an impulse uh, at, the, at the beginning, and it still lasts today, to externalize the threat and claim, no, it's someone else. It's someone out there. We have nothing to do with it. Uh, and it's also important that the uh, attempt to blame uh, jihadists by themselves is also part of an, a, a fantasy that the threat under which we are living is something that we can end. Mm -hmm. While if you look at the conditions that I've just described, our vulnerability is something that's going to last over time, proving, in fact, that we may be able to manage or reduce the threat to us, and I certainly think we could by various means, which we should discuss, but we can't end it. It's never going to be ended. So part of the, the language of war, for example, that they use its war fighting, not crime fighting, is due to the fact that a, a war model allows them to fantasize of a, a, a victory and of a, you know, ticker tape parade and a battleship finale. While if terrorism is like international crime, drug smuggling, then all we can do is reduce it and manage it, uh, mm -hmm. but we can't end it. And I think that is very hard for this particular group or maybe any politician to admit that the vulnerability is uh, going to last for, us, for, for our, our lifetimes uh, and it needs to be managed and it needs to be managed in cooperation with others and cannot be ended. So I think that, that those, those factors played a big role in the decision to, the, the very, very poorly thought through decision uh, to invade an oil rich Arab state in a, run by a secular dictator in an attempt to quiet uh, the Islamist, uh, uh, Islamist viol anti-American violence. Sidebar here about something that you point out that I think we should mention. The, these. Uh, people like Cheney and Rumsfeld were riding the wave of triumphalism that, that came from how they understood the end of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, the formula, namely, there can be uh, defeat of an adversary and the adversary can be transformed were, were byproducts in a way uh, not unimportant of their understanding of the end of the Cold War. I mean, one of the strangest things is that Al-Qaeda and the United States, or let's say the, the, certainly the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, and, uh, with whom uh, bin Laden was associated, the, uh, let's say Al-Qaeda on the one hand and the United States on the other had, a, had the same enemy during the Cold War, namely the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, both of them needed to find another adversary because they were uh, they, their, their whole psychological and uh, organizational system was built for an adversary. And they found each other, mm -hmm. strangely enough, eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think the, from a kind of point of view, the United States actually fit the bill. It is a world power and it has certain imperial dimensions. But Al-Qaeda, unfortunately, doesn't quite fit the bill. I mean, it's not, uh, it doesn't, there's, it's not similar to the KGB. It doesn't have a nuclear arsenal that could destroy the world 10 times over and so on. But that also is part of the, there's a misfit, even though 
And I think that also led, <clears throat> led them uh, to look for a, an adversary that had a kind of a coherence mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, it wasn't such a ragtag uh, ad hoc operation. And that explains part of the reason why they're searching for a, for a, for a, for a target that would be more susceptible to military conquest. Uh, there's an interesting play as you examine the, the people who made this policy between the ideas they had mm. and the contradictions among those mm. ideas and the politics of being able to act. So you, you point out, for example, that w w what we might call the military nationalists, Cheney and Rumfeld, that their ideas in some ways were inconsistent <clears throat> with the ideas of the neocons who basically said, hey, this is a time when we can go into the Middle East, drain the swamp, transform a place like Iraq, make it a model for the Middle East, and end terrorism in that way. But there were contradictions here. Yeah, yeah. So actually, the role of the Democracy Promotion Project in uh, uh, the shaping of, of policy toward uh, Iraq is it's still somewhat mysterious to me. But you're exactly right. There's one large contradiction. That is, if you follow the neocon argument, it is that uh, one of the conditions which makes terrorism arise is non-democratic government, the lack of a political horizon. Uh, dictatorships uh, run most Muslim countries, most Arab countries, and in these dictatorships, young people in particular have no political voice. And they take out their political frustration in their frustrations, which are, have political sources, in non-political, extra-political, often violent terrorists, politi in political violence. And this political violence can spill over uh, into the rest of the world, including can be targeted, uh, again, or uh, the, the targets can be the international sponsors of the dictatorships under which they live. Now, the strange thing about this analysis is that it makes the United States, in some sense, culpable for terrorism. And it actually suggests that the terrorists have a just cause. That is, they're fighting against dictatorship. So there's something, even though their means are horrendous and abominable, they have a just cause. And, we, and the neocons suggest, lightly, that the United States is partially culpable and must change its policy into a policy of supporting democracy. Now, that's a, that final step is always presented in a cloudy way because, as we mentioned before, politicians do not like to admit their own culpability. Um, and they, they are very happy to admit, the Bush administration was very happy to admit the culpability of, uh, of Clinton, but not of all American presidents in the last many decades because many were Republicans. So, uh, now, I think still the role of this rhetoric, the democratic rhetoric in uh, the wars, even though I'm sure Cheney and Rumsfeld had no interest in creating democracy, mm -hmm. um, one thing it did, it allowed uh, the war to go on and, and it allowed the American public to believe in part that it was being noble. There was something noble and, and mm -hmm. generous and elemosinary. Uh, uh, about its, uh, its decision to go to war in Iraq. And when the WMD rationale collapsed, there was an easy, smooth transition to this almost humanitarian intervention, helping the Iraqis get themselves out from under a terrible uh, uh, bestial dictatorship. Uh, that self-image of America as helping the Iraqis was in conflict with a very strong uh, motivation that was n noticeable across the political spectrum, which was to hurt the Arabs, to hurt those who hurt us. Someone's got to pay. We were hurt, and someone's got to pay. So I think there's a contradiction there, but it may be that, that Americans are, are comfortable with making someone pay, but they need to at simultaneously tell themselves that they're doing it for noble reasons. So I think probably, even though it wasn't a motivation for Cheney and Rumsfeld, it had a politically soothing and quieting effect, uh, that it was possible for some publicists and writers to say, yes, I, I, you know, there's, there, there's something ugly about this, uh, invading another country and uh, so forth, but uh, we're doing it for a good cause and that reconciles me to the policy. And, and, but even within the neoconservative uh, tradition, as we know it, beginning going back to the 70s, there, there was a, a notion from people like 
Kirkpatrick that we, oh, yeah. we, we, we essentially, democracy was a very difficult thing to put in <clears throat> place on, on the one hand. No, it's very, that's uh, a very, very amazing story because the, the reason Kirkpatrick got, uh, caught Reagan's attention was this famous essay on democracy and double standards where she indicts the American left, basically liber American liberals, for this fantasy that democracy can be created anywhere, that with a, you know, a six-week military campaign, you can change a political culture. Uh, and she's, that's foolish and absurd, and this is an American naivete. And that idea was so strong in Republican um, uh, thinking that George Bush, in a way, ran on it in the, in his, uh, in the, in the race with Gore. Uh, that's the source of the modest foreign policy. We can't make other countries uh, follow our model and so forth. So it was a very powerful idea. And I think to understand how that neocon la uh, uh, project, democratization project, got into uh, the thinking of the, of, or at least into the public rhetoric of the administration, it's a story that hasn't really been told. I think Sharansky has something to do with it. I think mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, a, there's a subterranean influence that we could maybe get into. But, uh, it's a mystery, and it's, it's something, although I've written about it at length, I think there's uh, much more to be understood than I've, I've plumbed. Now, now, once you go to Iraq, of course, you've got a problem, namely stabilization, the post-conflict situation. And, and again, the blinders were in place, and there was a, a, a here again, the word reckless fix, a reckless disregard for the set of problems. But this is, uh, I mean, we don't have uh, mm -hmm. as much time as we would need, but, but you're really suggesting that many things are going on here. One is Rumsfeld focus on winning the war and getting out, but you're also saying that we have to remember that in the 90s there was a left constituency for human, humanitarian intervention and they failed to realize that you needed to have political support to stabilize. And so, right. so there are, there are a, a complex set of reasons, including the blinders, that lead to a situation where we create a disaster and have not thought yeah. through what to do about it. No, definitely they don't seem to have asked the basic questions, what if, what then, nor to have thought a great deal about or prepared for the post-war. That's a, by now a general consensus. I think one way, to, one aspect of this that de deserves stressing is that Cheney and Rumsfeld probably believed it was fine to have Wolfowitz yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, to babbling on about democratization, but that if it didn't work, if it worked fine, if it didn't work, that was okay because uh, an a, a acceptable alternative for the United States was managed anarchy. Basically a festering system, a weak, a weak state in Iraq, a, a fragmented state, uh, which was unable to project power outward, which was not a denied area where we could uh, enter at will and assassinate any threatening individuals or groups and kill groups that were threatening the United States. So. That, the idea that if democracy doesn't work, the backup is not so bad, that a failed state, and I think that's a very important aspect of their blinders, a failed state, a weak state is not dangerous. This idea was so, uh, was such a radical, uh, such a radical mistake that if Saddam had possessed the chemical and biological weapons that they claimed they thought he had, the casus belli was that he had these terrible weapons, then by destroying his command structure, we would have caused the greatest proliferation disaster of world history, mm -hmm. uh, from which we were spared only by the fact that he didn't have these weapons. Mm -hmm. So, the, uh, of course, a failed state can threaten us if it loses control of a biological and chemical arsenal that could be sold in the open market and used against the West. So that underestimation of the danger of a failed state, I think, is a very important part of the, uh, of the story. Um, well, maybe that's, that's one point. Uh, I mean, there, there's so much in your book, and I recommend it highly, about the motivations of the mm. actors who made this decision. I want you to stand back for a minute, and going back to what you said about a theorist looking at motivation, what, how, how does this all hang together? I mean, are we looking at arrogance mixed mm. with fear, mixed with, uh, plus, plus uh, stupidity, plus in a way ignorance? Do, do you have a way of sorting this out in your own mind? I mean, how the, mm. Yeah. I definitely think uh, bad theories uh, and, and a weak understanding of the fragility of the institutions. Once Condoleezza Rice said, well, what we're going to do is go into Iraq and we'll destroy all the informal networks, the Tikriti clan and so forth, and then the institutions like the courts will work as before, mm -hmm. as if institutions did, weren't buoyed up by informal mm -hmm. social networks. I think just a lack of understanding. Or take 
the whole state building project that they uh, assume, the core of the, of the state are the, is the, the armed wing of the state bureaucracy, uh, the police and the military and the security services. And it looks like they believed that there would be uh, no problem in integrating the different ethnic and sectarian factions inside a unified uh, uh, security sector, uh, working together and loyal to a single leader, that that was not a difficult thing to do. Uh, and I think that's a kind of facile optimism or naivete which is inexplicable, except on the part of people who have never studied history. I've never mm -hmm. studied, don't, don't think about the, the difficulty of state building and the improbability. Uh, uh, don't understand the naturalness of anarchy and the, and the danger of anarchy. And you, this was very evident in Rumsfeld's remarks about stuff happens and mm -hmm. looting doesn't matter and it's just an ordinary thing and we have as many murders in Washington as they have in Baghdad, not mentioning the fact that all the murders in Baghdad were of policemen and so forth. Um, so I think a, a, a lack of understanding of how difficult it is to create order out of disorder. I think that's the fundamental idea. They sent somehow a sense that it would be n a natural order that could be easily handled and wouldn't have any uh, 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 lethal externalities, which is naive and, and, and reflects badly on their, uh, their learning. They, they also had very cuckoo, if not radical, uh, extremist views of American institutional history, American mm. institutions, how they can be manipulated uh, to achieve their ends. Talk a little about that, because bottom line here is they were successful mm. uh, at, on the home front, and, and, and they, they had a strategy and a legal theory about how to do it. Mm. Well, there are a couple things, many things to talk about here. And you're right, in this case, uh, as a political theorist studying the American founding and the origins of the Constitution, it helps me uh, understand what, how, what their approach was to executive power and how different it was than what was uh, anticipated uh, at, at the founding and, and, and the system which we have survived under and lived with um, since. So, um, uh, I, one, I, one very important uh, uh, premise of the Bush policy was that, which was developed during the Vietnam War, was that the American government is going to be unable to act with, in, uh, as it would like if it's going to create a, a, a reaction, in the, a negative reaction in the public. Mm -hmm. The way to avoid, uh, say, an anti-war movement is clearly not to have a draft. So they, they correctly perceived that in American history, all anti-war movements that were formidable were based on anti-draft movements. And the way to avoid an anti-draft movement was to have no draft, to have a professional army using high-tech weapons uh, in which maybe you recruited people who, from sectors of the economy where jobs were scarce. So that, and mind you, they combined this with a very uh, 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 wild, clever uh, decision uh, to replace taxes, which are normal in wartime, with borrowing from the Chinese and the Japanese central banks, uh, creating debts that would be paid back by voters who are no longer voting, who are no, not yet of voting age. Now, these two strategies together, eliminating the draft and not raising taxes, uh, were meant to put the public asleep, to keep the public asleep. Uh, because, as well, uh, you know that from Aristotle, the mm -hmm. basis of a democracy is the citizen soldier, and the one who can really press the government, the one that the government uh, has to answer to is the citizen who is contributing something to uh, the efforts of the government, such as war. By eliminating the citizen soldier, very deliberately, they were eliminating an obstacle to their war making. And I think that was based on an understanding deeper than the Constitution of how a government can act unaccountably. That's very important. Now, a second factor that's a little more technical is they learned, this has to do with congressional oversight of executive power. The largest story is, of course, that they controlled Congress uh, during the, the first uh, uh, six years, and therefore they were able to act more or less without supervision. But they used very cleverly congressional authorization to uh, immunize themselves from criticism. What they did in the authorization to use military force in Iraq was to call for a vote two weeks before a national election and before that time to have pumped into the public um, disinformation about the WMD threat from Iraq so that the Democratic congressmen who were facing re-election uh, 
had a choice to make. Were they going to appear weak on defense or not? And so they got an authorization out of Congress for war. And the congressman who voted for it afterward had a hard time saying we were duped because that's very embarrassing. We were fooled. We were, mm -hmm. we were strong-armed. In a way, paradoxically, the congressional authorization, which is meant to strengthen accountability, weakened it in the long term. So I think they are very clever tacticians, and they know how to use the system to destroy accountability, transparency. Uh, I think that's, the, in a way, the biggest story about their use of the constitutional system is the weakening, the dismantling of any kind of system of accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would say, uh, if you, uh, despite all the discussion today about invasions of privacy, much more important politically than invasions of privacy, although I think that's important, because if a government is spying on in the citizenry, it's very, over a long period of time, it's very difficult to believe that the government is working for the citizenry. That is the relation, democratic relation of a government as the servant of the people is difficult to sustain if the people are being spied upon. But in a way, more important than, or going along with this, is the growth of government secrecy, uh, uh, stonewalling. Uh, uh, making uh, the examination of government more and more difficult, the understanding of what the government is mm -hmm. doing more and more difficult. Or you could describe it this way. What they've accomplished is shift, shifted the boundary between the privacy of civil society and the secrecy of government and given us much more secrecy mm -hmm. of government and much less privacy of, of, uh, of, of citizens. And that is, I think, a major attack on our system of government. In a way, it's regime change. I think there is an element here of regime change that they're inflicting on us, mm -hmm. uh, and it's very radical. And, and it it's goes against the insight uh, uh, of our founding fathers in understanding that separation of powers could help in the correction of, er of, 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 of error, sure. so, so that our government was designed so our policymakers could learn and correct uh, course in midstream. No, I, I think that's right. So you put it this way, that the, that the American Constitution has three empirical premises. The first is that all people are fallible. All people make mistakes, including people in power. The second is that all people hate to admit their mistakes, especially people in power. And the third is that everyone is happy to expose or reveal the mistakes of their political rivals. And our constitutional system of checks and balances is designed based on these premises so that we assign the the power to make mistakes to one branch, the executive branch, and the power to correct mistakes to other branches and to the press and to the public. And what they have, their theory, the Cheney theory, uh, what they call it the Addington theory of government, has a very different premise, and which is the inerrancy of the executive, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or, the, 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 or the, the theory that the executive will perform better, will be able to solve problems more efficiently. Uh, if it is relieved from oversight, if it does n not have to give plausible reasons for its actions. I think that is the fundamental idea, and you see this. There's a wonderful passage in Woodward's book on, on Bush where he says, I love being president. I don't have to explain myself to anyone. Everyone has to explain themselves to me. And that's a, a homely way of putting this point more, much more forcefully uh, argued by the, legal, the lawyers uh, who, who worked for the administration which is basically the commander-in-chief authority in the Constitution means that the government does not have to explain itself to other branches and, in fact, has the right to lie mm -hmm. to Congress mm -hmm. and to the courts and, of course, to the public in pursuit of its unvetted uh, understanding of the national interest. In reading your book, uh, 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 you have a section where you're looking at our policies with regard to torture. Mm. And it, it's, it's someone, I was trained in political science, but what so many of the great theorists mm. had had to say about torture, it, it, it's, 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 in the American debate, we're always discovering something anew as if no one had ever. Uh, so I, I do want to quote this, and let's talk a little about it. You quote Aristotle, going back to Aristotle, and this is what Aristotle said about torture. Those under compulsion are as likely to give false evidence as true, some being ready to endure everything rather than tell the truth, while others are equally ready to make false charges against others in the hope of being sooner released from torture. Uh, I, I'm interested not so much of the truth of that insight, but the insight. It mm -hmm. was there, and, and this was another area where because the people we were torturing were not American yeah. uh, nationals, uh, the, the, the administration went wild. You know, just the other day, um, uh, Justice Scalia made a very strange argument in a, an interview with a British paper, I believe, uh, 
uh, saying that, well, uh, the constitutional ban on cruel and unusual punishment would not, uh, would not outlaw torture because that wasn't punishment. We were just trying to get information from people we had picked up. Now, as an originalist, he's going to have a hard time asserting that the founding generation thought that torture was okay in interrogation, because they certainly didn't, because they were the heirs mm -hmm. of a long tradition uh, 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 of opposition to torture, which was based on the belief that it's very unreliable, besides being unethical, inhumane, to take someone who is, and use their body as a, as a hostage and make their pain an instrument of your you know, wild search for truth. So uh, I want to say a word about the, the, the torture debate. Basically, the core of my argument in that chapter, after the historical material, which I think is quite interesting, actually, as you say, the weakness uh, of the argument that's being made in defense of torture uh, is quite extraordinary, if you think about it for a second. The claim that's most commonly put forward is, quote, that torture works. Now, the claim torture works is based on the assumption, or the, the, the assertion, that in actionable intelligence has been extracted from individuals under waterboarding or whatever methods have been used. And mind you, at least 30 people have died in American interrogation. So the three cases of waterboarding that they've admitted do not in any way exhaust what's been happening. So the claim is that actionable intelligence has been extracted by coercive means. Now, the extraction of actionable intelligence does not in itself justify torture. To justify torture, you have to prove that you could not have got that information otherwise. If I said I have to torture you uh, because I'm too lazy to walk across the hall and ask the CIA agent uh, who knows the information, that would not justify myself. I, it's necessary because I'm lazy. It's necessary because I can't read Arabic. I can't read the information. It's on the page three of the Yemeni newspaper. That's not a justification. So in this necessity defense, the necessity defense is actually very difficult uh, to make. It's presented by Bush's lawyers as if it's a slam dunk. And in fact, it's quite difficult because the government has many means available to it. What's more, maybe the reason it's necessary for me to torture is I haven't invested in other techniques, such as learning how to make a rapport with, with the prisoner, mm -hmm. or in my Arabic language skills and so forth, or my Pashto or Farsi skills. So I think uh, what I'm getting at here is that the the justifications used are very shoddy, very weak, much more so, even though they play well in public and they're repeated constantly. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a really uh, uh, sad commentary on the state of our uh, public uh, press that uh, this kind of justification is accepted as, uh, as definitive. It's interesting, as you give this example, I, it, the thought came to my mind that what characterizes this administration is uh, the withdrawal from reality mm. other than mm. their imagined reality, yeah. to use Mark Danner's term. So that, uh, and, and what's interesting in the example you just gave, they couldn't go across the hall to ask the CIA because they don't trust the CIA. Right. So, so as they withdraw from our traditions, from our institutions, you said yesterday in your lecture that they broke the interagency process, which is the way of learning. Well, so they're, they're a whole. Right. You know, they're, they're, it, it all sort of fits together, basically. No, there's a kind of passionate distrust of consultative government and a, I guess, based on arrogance, a belief they have all the answers, yeah. a belief that it's annoying to listen to dissonant or dissident voices. And it does, what, what, you feel there's an autistic quality yeah, about, the decision, what, yeah. about the decision making. Uh, living in a bubble, watching your own TV. You know that, those stories about Cheney, he wants, the, wants the, the TV turned on to Fox News before he even comes into the hotel room uh, <laughs> to make sure he doesn't hear anything that would disturb him, I guess. So this is a strange quality. We, we know that adversarialism and forcing people to listen to, they, uh, 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 and to answer uh, tough questions and to listen to different perspectives, that's a way of learning. That's what we do in science, we, double blind tests, and what we do in law courts. A prosecutor can be perfectly sure that he has a slam dunk case against someone. He goes into court and it falls apart under questioning, particularly when the accused party can help his lawyer pick apart state's uh, evidence. And the, the ignoring of these basic canons of rationality, I think that's one of the striking, really striking things about this group. Perhaps it came from the, from the think uh, tank uh, culture mm -hmm. uh, uh, in which uh, uh, instead of arguments and evidence driving conclusions, 
uh, you're, you're taught to start with the conclusion and to search for the evidence and arguments that will confirm what you already thought. That's cherry picking. Uh, and I think that method when applied to governance is uh, bound to lead to disaster. Help us understand why this breakdown of democracy in this period. Is it related to the fact that there are, uh, we, we're kind of a, a, the, manager, the reluctant manager of an empire mm. or, or maybe actually a manager of an mm. empire? Is that what's coming together here because, because there was over and above all of their strategies and their blindness and so on, there seems to be a systemic breakdown here. Mm -hmm. uh, does that route help us understand this? Hmm. Definitely um, uh, foreign policy, uh, one place where democracy does not work at all well is in covert actions abroad and in general in foreign uh, affairs because the American public is not concentrated on it. We know this, that people who live in Iran, let's say, uh, or Guatemala, probably know more about how the United States government has acted in their countries than American citizens do. Turns out it's just very difficult to get the American public roused about the abusive behavior of our government abroad. And I think that's the more and more uh, uh, that we're acting in a sphere where the immediate victims are foreigners, the least, the less well our system of accountability works. And as we were saying, uh, the, the most disturbing thing for an American citizen today is that uh, 100,000, 150,000, whatever the number is, Iraqis uh, who never harmed a single American are now dead. They have died because of our action. And this disgrace and uh, this sin, I don't know what's the word for it, this crime uh, is not something that could be mentioned in American political discourse by either party because the public doesn't seem interested. You know, the, the ha Baker Hamilton Commission report said that, we, that the American military isn't counting Iraqi dead. And I think that's something deep in our political culture. Uh, uh, remember that immediately after 9-11 and until today, American politicians continue to say that on 9-11, 3,000 Americans were killed even though we know that several hundred, 300, whatever the number is, were foreigners. And a skillful American politician could have, uh, talking to the Muslim world where the idea of hospitality is important, could have said what was injured on 9-11, one of the things that was injured was our ability to keep our guests safe. And it's a terrible crime against the American tradition. And we're, we're one of the reasons we are so devoted to extirpating this, uh, this threat is that it has harmed our ability to, to protect our guests. But no one said that. And the most liberal uh, American politicians today continue to use this phrase. That's very, that to me is very disturbing. And it shows that the Bush administration's um, going off the rails is somehow related and, and lack of, or the breakdown of democracy, as you put it, the weakness of our democratic system of accountability is rooted in passions and uh, cognitive biases of the American public. Assuming that the next president recognizes the mess that has been created mm. by this reckless response, how will, how will they navigate uh, our course toward the future in, in addressing the problem of terrorism mm. and in extricating ourselves from this mess? Well, it's going to be hard. Uh, and um, as, uh, as Pat Lang uh, uh, said, uh, when you drive your car off a cliff, your options narrow. So I think there's, there's a certain way in which we're stuck in a, mm -hmm. in a difficult situation now. And any one of Demo the, the, the Democratic president with the best intentions of the world is going to have a hard time. But the main, <clears throat> I think the one way to describe uh, the difficult choice ahead is uh, 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 the next president has to refocus our attention on the complex threat environment facing the United States and try to devote resources to the threats that are most grave and most dangerous. Uh, and many of these are not uh, groups who are railing and speaking in anti with anti-American rhetoric. That is, sometimes the greatest dangers are not uh, uh, in, in personal enemies, but are actually objective processes, such as global warming and contagious disease. These are the most prevalent. And I think 
the overemphasis on terrorism uh, and the underemphasis on global warming and contagious disease may be related to a defect in the human uh, and the human psychological hardwiring, or it may just be politics where it's easier to gain political support by saying you're going to crush an enemy than saying you're going to deal with these long-term problems, which of course require uh, international cooperation. So I would say, first of all, uh, shifting from an enemy-centered to a threat-centered understanding mm -hmm. of the dangers of the future, and uh, uh, particularly concentrating on, if we're thinking of terrorism, on incapacitation. Incapacitation means uh, uh, weakening the capacities of those groups who will, who will always be there who want to hurt us. Now, we can't declare war on cheap airline tickets, I, as I said, but we could do more to secure the loose nuclear materials in, say, Russia. We, the Bush administration came to power and uh, uh, cut funding for the Nunn-Luger program. So I think uh, even though small towns in Russia have more nuclear material than Iran and Iraq together could produce in, in 30 years, uh, we have not focused on limiting that capacity to do us harm in the way we should. The petrodollar, you know, we're pouring these petrodollars into these, um, I think having a, 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 conser a, 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 a comprehensive energy policy obviously is something that's vital for protecting us from terrorism in the future. So those are two things. But I, I, I'm not sure, this is, it really is a question. Can an American, does an, any American politician have strong enough nerves, to use Cheney's phrase, uh, to actually admit to the public that the threats we're facing uh, will have to be managed and, we'll, and there is no definitive solution and we are going to be vulnerable. Uh, that the best we can do is, uh, is reduce the threat rather than eliminating it. I think that's one of the basic challenges. And, and this sounds to me like a problem of political education. Mm. Uh, that, that seems to yeah. be key, not just winning yeah, yeah. Uh, the votes and so on. So, so what does a, a theorist say mm -hmm. about that problem and how you address it? Uh, well, that's awfully difficult, Harry. But I, one thing I'm sure of is, uh, and this is a kind of an, an, an answer that has to do with education, the American uh, vulnerability to the world is paradoxically related to the dominance of the English language uh, mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, the dominance of the English language is strangely a, 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 a sign of our weakness and the strength of our enemies. For kids who are, let's say, radical, anti-American um, Islamists in Karachi or Jeddah could use the internet and sign up for a flight school course in Oklahoma. But for American kids in Harlem couldn't do that in Jeddah or Karachi because we have an asymmetry. That is, we're transparent to them, but they're opaque to us. So that, as a background fact of our position in the world today, that is, our transparency and their opacity, is very, very dangerous allows our government to act in irresponsible ways because the society doesn't know enough um, uh, to, to check them. It, uh, it also, it allows what I would consider maybe one of the most immoral uh, features of our foreign policy, which is the willingness to invade a country which we have not bothered to study. I think that's, uh, besides being reckless and imprudent, it's, that's immoral, among other things. But invading is its own immorality, but not bothering to learn about the country thinking it's not important to learn about it, is shameful, dishonorable, and, and unethical. So uh, education, one of the things that I think has to be concentrated upon now is the devotion of national security resources to the uh, language training and to the, uh, and to the historical knowledge of Americans who are going to be involved in politics of the rest of the world. Uh, and this is never going to uh, eliminate the asymmetry I discussed in, but we can repair it. And I think that understanding uh, the importance of that, uh, of, of the education of our citizenry in the, the languages and cultures of other peoples, is it would, could, I think, do something to improve our security condition in the future. One of the things we have not discussed that I think is important in this context, but you mentioned it in the book, is that all of this happened in a context where America power was really unchecked, especially mm. military. There was no balancer. Mm. The Soviet Union was gone. Will, will some of this be corrected by the emergence of a, of a multi-polarity, uh, of, of the ability of other powers to check our power, mm. if not yet in the military? That will probably take a while. Right, and, and, and uh, the, the limits uh, 
of our military superiority, the fact that we are uh, un unparalleled militarily, but we can't work our will in Iraq. It turns out that our great power doesn't mean we can get what we want. That's been shown. But you're very right. Part of the background of this is that we built up this enormous military uh, arsenal and capacity to fight the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union collapses, and we're standing with this enormous capacity. And there was a gloating, a sense, OK, now we have the world at our feet. We can do whatever we want. There was omnipotence fantasies that came out of this. During the Cold War, the hotheads in the uh, Republican Party had been constantly checked by sober individuals who thought, no, you can't be reckless in your behavior because you may uh, trigger a response from the Soviet Union and you may trigger a third world war. When this, after the Soviet Union collapsed, those sober minds, sober heads, uh, left office. And the more, more, more hot-headed group were unchecked internally yeah. with their fantasies. Yeah. Because, and the belief was, well, they may make mistakes, but they're not going to trigger a third world war because the Soviet Union doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I think that, actually, the, the lowering of the threat uh, produced more recklessness. Uh, this is, a, uh, in a way, a more salient threat uh, chastened the decision makers and the less salient threat. Uh, relieve them of, uh, of worrying about consequences. And we saw, of course, that when you don't worry about consequences, they come back to bite you. Mm. One, one final question. How does Bush fit into all of this? Mm. Because really part of the, the mythology that we had uh, 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 developed, especially since the end of World War II, was you know, the, the chief executive mm -hmm. managing all of these contradictions that make our system work. Right. Was it, is it that he was just ill-prepared for the job? Well, I, I think that's certainly true, that he wasn't prepared. But actually, understanding Bush's role in all this is uh, it's important. I don't think he was negligible. Certainly, the White House, and by this I mean Condoleezza Rice and so forth, the National Security Council in the first term did not do its job in keeping the Pentagon uh, in a subordinate position. And that was because of the just a paradox that Cheney and Rumsfeld, as a team were able to push through a certain policy line and uh, which went around, uh, did, ran circles around Colin Powell and the State Department and so on. And that was really Condoleezza Rice's job to make sure that the State Department would have a more effective voice in the inner councils of the president. But uh, I don't know. I think there's a, there was a really great story that was told to me by uh, Shlomo Avineri about the uh, uh, Rabin cabinet, which tells you something about, uh, uh, about the necessity for a chief executive or a president to have knowledge in order to know how to take advice. And the story is very simple. It goes like this. A general came in uh, to the cabinet meeting and says, I, I want your permission to take a bridge in the north. And Rabin answered, said, well, you know, I know that bridge, general, because I fought up there. And there's a hill over the bridge. And it's useless to take the bridge if you don't take the hill. So, general, if you're asking me, can you take the hill, the answer is no. <laughs> Which means if you have no background knowledge, mm. you don't know what you're being asked. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a problem to have an ill-prepared president who has very strong-willed advisors who know how to ask questions at a certain time. Apparently the way it worked is that in, in cabinet meetings, Cheney would remain silent. Objections were raised. Cheney said nothing because he doesn't want to be contradicted mm -hmm. publicly. Then he would take Bush into the next room and tell him what to do. And, and so the objections were never aired. And part of the reason we've got ourselves in such trouble is that worries about possibly negative consequences were not processed, were not incorporated into the thinking uh, because the president was weak. Stephen, on that note, I want to thank you very much for being on our program. Let me show your book again to our audience, which uh, I recommend is one of the best I've read on uh, the aftermath of 9-11. Thank you very much for thank being here. Thank you very here. much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.